I'm here to talk uh, as an Italian in New Zealand and to present my book uh, of memoir. A friend from my local U3A asked me how long did it take me to write the book? Because she said she had been working on her memoir for two years and there was no end in sight. And I said, keep going girl, it took me more than 20. <laughs> So we migrated in 1996 and we found a young country with its legends like uh, olive oil sold in pharmacies. And it's not a legend, it's actually true. Strange invitations to come at tea, not at 5 p.m. but at 7 p.m. And to bring a plate, <laughs> which is quite was quite puzzling, but uh, people were friendly. There was no traffic uh, to speak of, and the spoken language was very similar to the English that we had studied at school. The question we were asked uh, more often was, uh, what brought you to New Zealand? And my answer was very, very brief, adventure, because uh, we were in our, uh, mid 40s, we had our careers, uh, a little daughter, uh, we were playing bridge on Sundays, having holidays on the mountains, we even had a little sailboat. So it was the right moment to throw everything up in the air and start all over again. Um, before that, uh, we had lived for almost five years in Japan, where we acquired our dog. And then when we came back to Italy, we had our daughter. Uh, so we had been a bit uh, around, we had already had the taste of living overseas and in a speaking language country. So we were looking for adventure just for something new. We didn't know what, we had no idea. We were open to anything. And so we came, we chose Christchurch because it seemed to us the quintessential European town of the fifties. It was very easy to get around. It was very friendly, it was very nice. And uh, I would like to read you one page. Everyone we started a conversation with would ask if we were missing Italy. We weren't apart from friends and family who were supposed to visit soon. Life in Christchurch was easy and interesting, and I enjoyed having stopped the working as a maths teacher and becoming a full-time mother, housewife, driver, gardener. Italy was always present under the surface of my daydream, sorry, of my daytime. A small episode would trigger the memory of something similar that had happened there. Sometimes I would see someone and find an uncanny resemblance to an Italian acquaintance. At times, the similarities between the two countries made me wonder where I really was. At times, the differences would bite me and leave a sense of displacement. Usually there was so much to try and to do that nostalgia wouldn't surface, but often in my dreams, I saw stones, stones as in dry stone walls of country lanes, as in Renaissance palaces, as in mountain tops. The stone appeared in all their various aspects and colors, old, mossy, architectural or not, and it was quite strange. Then I noticed that there were no stones around us. There were wooden fences and the houses were made of a wood frame covered in jibboard, clapboard or bricks. The oldest buildings like the Christchurch Cathedral or the Art Center were in the neo-Gothic style made of dark gray stones with white trim at the edges. Only the Catholic cathedral was in white stone, a more familiar sight, but it was a rarity. So many nights I saw in my dreams those different stones, 
And many morning, I realized that as happy as I was, I still had an umbilical cord tied to the old country. And there was no point in denying it. I started feeling a sense of obligation, not material, not moral, only deep and emotional. For the following 20 odd years, I would work for the Italian Dante Alighieri Society, also founding its Italian language school. I would coach the opera chorus, teach Italian language and Italian cooking, produce an Italian radio program and the TV series of Italian cooking, and so and so and so. Besides embracing a career as the marketing manager for our wine business. In due time, I stopped the dreaming of stones, but sometimes with little prompting, memories came back of places and events, clamoring not to be lost, but to be remembered, revisited, reinterpreted. They were the foundation of who I was and the framework for who I was becoming. I would enjoy those memories, smile at them and jot them down. I'm not planning on serving the story of my life on paper. It's unremarkable, and many would find it rather dull, at least compared to others. But my memories may be fun to read. So that was uh, the, the framework. We fully enjoyed the, the opportunities of a new life in a new country. Because if you immigrate to a new country and you try to do exactly what you were doing or try to be exactly the person you were before, it doesn't work. You have to, uh, as I said here, this is also a woman's personal story of emigrating to a new country and integrating with the local way of life, something many will identify with. They will recognize their own efforts to meet new challenges while maintaining their core personalities as defined by their country of origin and their personal and collective memories. Sorry. So I've done some teaching language at uh, the university. Uh, I've done uh, radio and I, was seeing myself more as a journalist than as a writer. And so there is an aphorism that comes to mind that every journalist has a book in their drawer and there it should remain. But still, it was worth a try. And I kept writing in very disorganized way, not discipline at all. Also writing uh, uh, bits in Italian, bits in English, uh, no time frame, nothing. Was I thinking of a book? Yes, of course. Everyone who writes more than a shop list is thinking of a book, or are they lying at least to themselves? But I was too busy until 2018, when we sold our property, which included the vineyard, to the Christchurch City Council that needed the land. And we moved to Auckland because we wanted to resume sailing. And this is the only place, really. And uh, so actually, we first chose the marina where we would keep uh, the boat that we were going to buy. And then we chose a house in the neighborhood. I was a bit uh, uh, more free. So I opened that drawer and out came all this avalanche of uh, bits and pieces. Uh, so I had the problem of, uh, well, filling the gaps because uh, uh, memories come uh, in uh, segments, not in uh, a continuum. And actually in 2021, there was uh, the uh, commemoration of the 10 years of the Christchurch earthquakes. And I said, well, look, everybody's talking of the earthquakes, but I was there 
and I haven't written anything. Let's do it. So I started writing and from there in a couple of days came the four longest <laughs> chapters of the book. There was so much to, to tell, uh, not just to tell of the earthquake, but to tell uh, of the earthquake from our point of view, how we lived them. And we were just an example among the Christchurch people. Uh, I had the problem of finding uh, a narrative. At some stage, uh, my studio was all covered with the uh, pieces of papers with all the various chapters that I was desperately trying to put in a sequence, but they seemed the more, uh, I don't know how it's called uh, that game uh, the children play with plastic, uh, with the red and blue uh, dot, uh, and you put a foot on one and the hand on the other. That was how my book looked. <laughs> and there was a problem of the tenses because initially I had thought of using past tense for the past memories and present tense for the developing life in New Zealand. But then what was past, present at the beginning had become past after 20 years. So not all the present was present at the same time. And that was a bit of a problem. Eventually, I found a narrative, also taking care of the rhythm of the book, because very often books start with a bang and end with a whimper. And from one third or mid point, if you are lucky, it goes up and then peters out. So I tried to balance uh, momentous moments <laughs> with the flat considerations. And of course, the unwind at the end. At that point, uh, I sent uh, the manuscript to fewer than a dozen of first readers. Some of them knew me, some of them didn't, and they came out uh, with uh, general advice. I had only asked for general advice. And I took a lot on board, every time uh, reworking, uh, re rewording, uh, etc. And then I started sending the manuscript to um, publishers, sending, waiting. Some of them uh, sent a kind uh, thank you, no thanks. Some of them just uh, gave their denial by neglect. Because the landscape of publishing in New Zealand has been changing in the several last years. Uh, the medium-sized publishers have been uh, acquired by the big international groups uh, and the few independent publishers that remain are short of everything, mostly of uh, manpower or reading power. And so uh, there were a couple, a couple of publishers that were interested but couldn't give me a time frame at all. Next year, perhaps, I can promise. At that point, uh, uh, I had uh, three problems. One, uh, that the more time passed, uh, the more uh, I kept adding, because you know memory, you start digging out, uh, the more <laughs> uh, things come out. And oh, that's interesting, I put it here. That's interesting too, I put it there. And I was already, already well beyond the 100,000 uh, words that are really the maximum you should write, at least for a first book. And because I had uh, uh, reached that uh, level of length, I had decided to stop at 2018 when we moved to um, Oakland. So there was all the COVID time left behind and all the memories that I couldn't fit in this one. And I had already started working on that uh, follow-up. The third reason was that uh, I'm 74. So I said, if I have to wait for uncertain length of time, it may well happen that uh, my memoirs may be published, but perhaps posthumous, and where would be the fun of that for me? So I decided to self-publish. 
I sourced the, a uh, printer in offshore. I asked them if they knew of any copy editor and they found me a very reliable one. And in two months, the book was printed in paper and put on Amazon, on Kindle and paper and distributed nationwide. So it's a very quick process. On the other hand, not having uh, all the backup from uh, the publisher that uh, organized for you interviews, uh, talks, uh, etc., means you have to do everything on your own. But I'm happy with that and I'm happy to be talking to you. Let me check the time. So, what, uh, what to do about uh, writing? I think uh, everybody has something to talk about. And uh, a memoir is a good point uh, to start. Also because until you start writing yourself, uh, you don't become a good reader because writing makes you a good reader. You, you read uh, not only what appears on the page, but you read what goes underneath. You see how much of the trick of the trade the writer has used. So uh, his skills come to you threadbare. After taking all those skills out, is the story still good for you? Are you still enjoying it? So you can go deep and deep in the mind of the writer as well. Uh, and uh, a memoir is easy to write because uh, you have the plot already. You have your cast of characters and well-defined. No need uh, to imagine it and to make them uh, life-wise. You just have to give them a voice and start. And uh, what I found uh, when I started writing uh, and self-publishing, uh, first uh, that uh, there is no bias anymore about uh, self-publishing. People say, congratulations. I was afraid that people would say, oh, or think you couldn't find uh, a publisher happy to take you on. No, I couldn't, <laughs> but there's no shame in that. <laughs> So that's encouraging for everyone. Uh, we've been lucky from uh, one point of view that uh, uh, because we embraced the new things, we did the new things and uh, uh, we open up, uh, open ourselves up to new experiences. And that was really what New Zealand is great at with the newcomers you really have room to do things. Certainly in the uh, late 90s in Christchurch, you did that. And of course, the vineyard was our biggest adventure. Also because uh, uh, we didn't know much about wine apart from drinking it and enjoying it. So uh, starting the vineyard, establishing it from scratch, there were paddocks has been a great adventure. I've been the marketing manager and that gave uh, not only to me but also uh, to both of us uh, the opportunity to travel overseas. We exported in Australia and China. So New Zealand was really for us uh, a uh, starting point for a lot of things. And actually one reason why this book uh, came uh, up was uh, that just before leaving Christchurch, the local residents association invited us uh, to a farewell party. And, uh, uh, and we went there and there were a lot of speeches. And uh, some of them said, look, uh, we've been working with you for more than uh, 20 years because they made the core of our workers on the vineyard. And they said that we know you, we know of you, we know bits and pieces, but I don't think we really know you. Why don't you please write uh, something for the Craycroft newsletter? 
and they promised. Well, they didn't expect the 400 pages, I didn't either. <laughs> so. so in the end, what is this book about? Uh, and what is it? Uh, I call it a summer read because it's light, entertaining. Um, we are blessed with sense of humor and uh, the sense of humor goes throughout the book. It's fundamental to survive in a new country, otherwise you wouldn't survive. So it's fun, mostly fun. On the other hand, it's not just a summer read because there are uh, all these experiences that are so common. For instance, parenting to a child that uh, is going to be bilingual and bicultural. And it's something that uh, all people coming uh, to New Zealand uh, with children have, have tried. And there are all the other in, um, consideration about uh, uh, immigration, cultural differences, uh, animals, nature that in New Zealand you can enjoy because I always make the confrontation with Italy. Same surface, New Zealand 5 million inhabitants, Italy 50 million. So the ratio people to nature is a bit different here. And so you are much closer to landscapes, to animals. And it's more important, even more important the way you relate to all these things. So these are all things that go far beyond my and our personal stories. So it's good for people to discuss. I find that usually um, book clubs are eager to talk about these things. So this would be good for book clubs. And uh, I would be happy to be contacted by anyone who wants a free talker. Um, and uh, uh, actually there is the um, Facebook page that I've created, Wilma's Tales, and there you can uh, message me and find uh, uh, all the information of events. And uh, I'm also happy to get in touch to have your comments on the book. Thank you very much.